Hi everyone, and welcome to this very special webinar this week. And we're doing Your Retirement Your Way with InvestSmart. I'm Tom Wilson, I'm one of the Investor Education Specialists at InvestSmart. And I'm joined by Evan Lucas, our Chief Market Strategist, as always. We've got a very special guest. I'm just sorry to jump the gun there, Ev. Um, we've got Drew Meredith, who is the founder and advisor at Waddle Partners. So he's literally our man to go to when it comes to talking about everything retirement. Um, he thinks about retirement in his sleep, apparently. So he's across this. Uh, we'll try and capture everything about retirement into a really short little webinar. And it's a question and answer type approach. So we've got some questions ready to go. We've uh, taking live questions as we go. As always, uh, it's general product advice only, not any kind of personal financial advice, but I'll stop talking. Welcome, Evan, and welcome, Drew, to the webinar. Thanks, Tom. Mate, Drew, good to have you on the program. It's, it's really lovely to have someone like you here talking about retirement because, as you guys say at Waddle Partners, it's literally what you do all day, every day. Um, and we know that you know the people on here listening, they are all over it. It's something they talk about us all the time about. So before I get started with you, Drew, just to those of you watching out there, as Tom said before, over on the right-hand side of your go-to webinar uh, portal, don't forget, click on the questions, stick them in there at any time. The three of us will jump onto them very, very quickly. We've also started with this page here. I think this is probably a good scenario just to sort of also give you a bit, a bit of a guideline about how we want to translate through. Looking at what we're going to cover, you know, diversified investment, sustainable drawdowns, income capital preservation, volatility protection, tax efficient investment. And that's why we've got Drew here, because this is what he does. So Drew, welcome to the program. Thank you. Good to be here. And um, we were talking just before offline about the whole thing here. I just want to start with that that first point, the diversified investment. I mean, you had a really, really interesting opening when we were speaking about this offline about, you know, why retirement is different to accumulation. Can you, can you take us through why having a diversified investment and thinking about retirement as what it is, is so important to, to what you do and, and why your clients do what you do? Yeah, I think investment and a lot of the industry is perfectly set up for for the accumulation phase. You know, where you where you're able to keep contributing, you're able to accept higher levels of risk and and get the benefits of compounding, but not much. We've seen this with the amount of speaking we've been doing recently. Not much is set up for decumulation, and it requires you know once you've got a finite pool of capital, it requires a different approach to investing that I just described as kind of being more resilient. So how do you have a more resilient portfolio that isn't as influenced by macro conditions. So, you know, inflation's a concern this year, but we didn't think about it two years ago. So how do you put different asset classes, different investments, even within within your equity or global, whatever, whatever you're looking at, how do you put multiple assets together that will allow you to generate an income every year, regardless of what's happening? You know, if the predictions on cash, on the RBA cash rate are wrong, like they were like two years ago, um, or if the predictions on inflation are wrong, you don't want to be positioned for one outcome when it doesn't end up in that. That that's not the end result. So on that, because I, you know, going a bit further, the discussion has always been about diversification, particularly lately. You know, are certain asset classes dead? Um, you know, should you be going anywhere near fixed um, fixed income? Do you you look at you know outside of the box and look to alternatives. What, what's your view at the moment around diversification, particularly with retirement and that additional income stream you talk about? What, what, what's your view at the moment around you know those asset classes that have been described as probably not something to be in anymore? I, th I just published an article recently that said there's never been a better time for a retiree to build a portfolio. There's, if you compare it to say two years ago, I think the first, it might've been the first of January 2022, was that when the market peaked? Um, yep. Not sure. 2020, um, uh, August 2022 was the peak. Yeah, exactly. And you've turned around from that point. You had the NASDAQ at an all-time high, the S&P 500 at an all-time high, the ASX at an all-time high. You turn 12 to 18 months later, and most of them are down 30, 20, 10% at least. Uh, and at that point, it was very difficult to go and buy an index or alternatively to buy government bonds or a term deposit because you were getting less than 1%. Turn to today, you can get a term deposit for 4%. Uh, you can get government bonds. So, you know, never essentially never defaulted you're yielding something like three to 3.7 to four percent you can get hybrids yielding 5.5 you got more options than ever to build a sustainable income stream from a portfolio of assets at a lower risk than what you were doing you know six 12 18 months ago so i think all those interest rates going up is seen as a negative because of the impact it has on asset prices and valuations of of shares and property and other assets but it's actually a positive for people that have 
already have capital because it opens up a whole range of additional options. There's a, yeah, a question that we had come in from Diane and uh, some other people have asked about hybrids and bonds, um, you know, whether they're the same when you're trying to construct a diversified portfolio uh, in retirement like that. What's your opinion on that? I think when you look at these different asset classes, we kind of separate them into being floating rate or variable rate and fixed rate, and each has a different role to play. And when we're constructing a portfolio, we'll try and blend both floating rates. So that's a hybrid. If for those listening, you probably know the interest you get from a hybrid is reset every quarter or every six months. So, and that's not based on the cash rate, it's based on the market rate, which goes up and down every day. So the 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 challenge of investing in hybrids is if interest rates start falling, your income falls as well. On the alternative, if you're investing into bonds, government bonds are traditionally fixed rate, your income remains the same regardless. So it's about pulling those levers and balancing both of them based on the conditions that are occurring. So perfect timing 12 months ago to be buying, being all floating rate when there was a threat that interest rates would go up and impact on your fixed rate investments. And now it's probably closer to you know, blending both of them together because there's there's less certainty that interest rates are going to keep increasing and there's probably just as much chance that they fall as as go up from here. So I'm actually going to jump in as well because there's a second follow-up question to that, which was David, um, and he's got a, a strategy question around pretty much what we've just discussed. So I've got to read it out. So how valid is a strategy that provides 50% of pension income via rolling ladder of hybrid redemptions? Is this strategy... Um, have a benefit of maintaining a 25% fixed interest shortfall is that fixed interest provides 5% franked income, less inflation. So probably the question there as we went through from the whole thing we've talked about, Drew, is, you know, how in, in retirement you deal with, with dual income streams. Is is that something that you guys look at a lot? Is it, is, it a, is it a good way to think about it that, you know, you use your pension income strategy from the fixed income side or the defensive part of your portfolio? How, how do you guys position yourself for that? We try and have a blend of both. So, you know, you these historically or for the last five or 10 years, you couldn't get much income from your fixed income component. So being able to rely on that more and more, uh, in some cases, gen, obviously general only, general advice only, but you can actually have a balanced fund that's truly balanced and still yep. look, get close to, to getting your usually 5% income objective. Our key with that is like resilience, which I said at the start, if you're going to rely solely on, it, you know, hybrids, which they're, complex yes there's probably a very low risk that they fail or or default at any point particularly if it's the big four banks it's still we uh, you know as fiduciaries to to building portfolios for clients we'd always try and be prudent and have more diversification around that income stream rather than just relying on a single sector being the banking sector which is where most of them most of them come from and i think that the risk is what i said before that if you're relying solely on floating rate and if interest rate intra increases have an impact on the economy and ultimately end up in rates falling, which everyone's predicting in 2024, well, that means your 5% that you're expecting today could quickly go down to four and three and a half and your income is has fallen by 40%. So that's where not relying, not relying too much on floating rate or fixed rate, but actually in introducing other asset classes like Australian equities, global equities, even if the yields lower infrastructure alternatives um, diverse range of options these days. So I'm going to pick you up on that as well, because before we move off the diversification topic and on to the next one, there is questions we get quite regularly around alternatives and alternatives being a whole range of things, gold and whatever else. We don't normally talk about them here, but I do think it's good to get you on here and talk about it. Can I ask your opinion about having alternatives, having something like gold, or let's also, you know, slightly talk about the, the the big elephant in the room, cryptocurrency. I mean, there's been some stories over the last week or so about, you know, people that have changed their super fund into just going into things like crypto. Do you, do you try and steer clients away from it? I, or is it something that you're aware of that they need to have or if they want to have that you get them involved as well? I keep gold and crypto separate. So I've had it, we've, yeah. we've helped. <laughs> We've had gold for quite a while as you know, as and the key to us is how do you how do you manage decumulation? How do you how do you have assets? The most important part when you're building a portfolio for retirement is having assets that don't fall when the stock market falls. You want to have investments that you can sell to deploy into cheaper markets effectively, because we know what happened in the GFC is your equity uh, your equity portion fell 30 or 40 percent. You had nothing to sell to to buy equities when they were cheap. So we've had gold as a hedge within portfolios just held via an ETF uh, and that's the sole aim is being one it provides a currency hedge but also something we can sell at another point 
Um, I constantly receive questions on it though. It's people don't struggle to understand it because it doesn't provide an income. How do you value it appropriately? So it's more about a portfolio construction tool for us. Uh, we, we kind of encourage that sort of asset class and we spent more time trying to keep people out of crypto in 2021, which was difficult when it was going so well. You know, we don't, we don't want to say no to everything all the time. Um, or when the ideas did come up, we'd essentially guide people towards what we saw as more diversified, less risky options that were more suitable to retirees. Um, but essentially, you know, the concept fits what you look for in a portfolio and alternative assets. You want non-correlated returns. So the issue with crypto was that it was as correlated to equity markets as any other asset class. What we'll do is we'll move on to the next topic. So strategies for sustainable retirement and uh, drawdowns. So looking at strategies of sustainable retirement and drawdowns, you've, you've spoken about it a bit already there, Drew, with regards to having multiple income streams, multiple you know, thought processes. But I also want to start with something that you've been talking about a, a bit there as well, which is how you start to draw down. Um, can you talk about a strategy setups to deal with a starting the drawdown and B how you use that to to fund what you do because I think particularly for a lot of people you know going as you said from a the accumulation phase into the retirement phase and actually going from building wealth to using wealth how do you deal with that how what is the strategies that you guys use to get clients to understand that that you're now into using your wealth rather than obviously building your wealth it's incredibly emotional and one of the most difficult parts of being an advisor at that in that period of people's lives because you know if you're you've been in business and you've been saving every year the market if you've got a million dollars the market falls five percent um you're down 50 grand that could have been a year's salary or something like it's very an unnatural environment to be in um so the biggest one we always talk about is how do you disconnect your the income that your investments are producing from the income that you're spending on the other side because we know that dividends are paid twice a year and most managed funds or ETFs only play once or, or quarterly. So we've say, seen with the emotional impact that just worrying about what dividend Telstra is paying or what dividend CBA is paying, and I can only spend that income. We try and break, essentially break that part completely using data. You know, we, we use an asset consulting firm using data that shows that you can easily generate in this, an Australian investor 5% per annum in income from a reasonably balanced portfolio. And just reiterating that in every meeting that if you've got a million dollars, you can easily generate $50,000 in income. And don't worry about when that comes in over a 10 year period, you should be comfortable spending that amount. I know it's different to the 4% withdrawal rate that everyone talks about, but um, that's our, you know, franking credits are a free kick in Australia with, with that sort of uh, strategy as well. So I think it's reiterating. So, simple, I'm just going to jump in on yeah. that. How, how do you set that up? What What is your strategy to set that kind of potential up? Because I know we have clients ask us that exact idea all the time. What What's the setup for that? Like, is it, you know, slowly but surely selling their CBA shares, their Telstra shares or their exchange traded fund or whatever it is? What is the strategy for that? Because that is a question we get all the time. Yeah, we say our job is about managing cash flow, not about managing dividends or income. So we, the way we've found that works is having discipline around reviewing portfolios. We'll, for every one of our clients, and we suggest people doing it themselves should do the same thing, review every part of your portfolio every quarter. So look at your asset allocation, look at your investment selection, then also make sure you've got enough in cash to fund six to 12 months of living expenses at any given time. That's where you, you initially get that confidence. And it's once you get to that point, then you start thinking more about the investments that lie above it. So it's how do you give them, one is that sleep at night. Yes, there's cash in the bank to spend my money tomorrow. The second is, what if equity markets fall 40%? I need another pool of assets that I can sell down to, so I don't have to sell my fallen equities. And that's where you start looking at, as we said before, fixed in interest and, and the other investments that fall in there. And then it's- I was gonna ask, yeah. oh, sorry. Um, it sounds, that sounds like a lot about the, like the bucket strategy, the three buckets that a lot of people uh, who ask us questions about it, um, they refer to. Is that a similar idea where you have that first bucket uh, enough liquid cash or something readily convertible to cash on hand? Yeah, I think kind of. We just yeah, we just call it sleep at night. It's um and it's different for each pe each person. So it's how do you? Some people you know feel like they need 
50% of their money in cash. So it is it is very personal and we hate trying to oversimplify it into, into rules, but I think buckets would work. We, I think it's because we've used buckets at another point when we're <laughs> building our portfolios and it just complicated uh, the way we explained it. But it is that, yeah. How do you give people confidence to that the part where they're taking risk is appropriate and, and is working and that they don't have to worry about selling or, or that part of their portfolio? And I guess as an advisor, do you spend a lot of your time trying to make people realise the opportunity cost of that? Like if they have much more liquid cash uh, in the bank or on hand, they're obviously missing out on uh, a different return elsewhere? It's more, uh, less less difficult now that you can get income from it. But over the last, you know, three or four or five years, we get phone calls if there was more than like $10,000 cash in a client's account because they were getting zero interest on it. So it was finding lower risk options to make sure you're at least getting a little bit of cash, but then you also had the flexibility to deploy that. And actually, I think the part of that cash flow management and the quarterly review of your portfolio is actually thinking, do I deploy this now into what market environment is around at that point in time? I was going to say that's um because that would be a, definitely a much more like hands-on active type approach as to, to passive. Um, we, we get a lot of questions talking about whether you, you know, a passive income industry super fund is better or start your own SMSF uh, with direct share investing. Uh, do you have any insight on those two at all? It's kind of, it, well, as I probably said on the, I've probably spoken to Evan about it before, which was it depends. <laughs> <laughs> There's a gag going out, a meme, I think, about that at the moment, which is it yeah. kind of depends on each person. So you, you don't, and in a lot of cases, you don't know exactly what you're holding in an industry fund and whether you're actually generating income. I think the way it's structured is you're selling units in your investment to fund your pension when it comes out anyway. Uh, and it's what do you prioritise? Do you want to know where you're investing and do you want to know what income is coming or are you comfortable just being allocated to a broader pool of investments and you're you're having income and capital come out on a regular basis and for some people you know one option works for some people another option works um, naturally I think being able to see and control gives a lot of people particularly professionals or or those that have been in their own business that's why people that's why SMS is so popular at the moment um, and then the investment approach of Broadly, industry versus SMSFs is very different. There's the, the member base of uh, industry funds is incredibly young. So they're naturally tilted towards growth, compounding illiquid assets and growing faster um, or yeah, taking more risk and locking capital up for longer. Whereas the alternative is knowing what you've got and where it's allocated and what you're exposed to. I think we'll move on from that. That's a, that's a fantastic way to sort of, sort of finish that, that strategy for sustainable retirement. So the next thing then to, to cover off on Drew is, is to look at, you know, balancing income generation and capital preservation. I know we've sort of somewhat been touching it early, but this is the next big step. As you've talked about, there is that emotional attachment that comes with, with this side. Also understanding that, you know, time. And I know that you would get this question all the time. What if I run out of funds before I actually, you know, finish up with with needing it what what are the, the the significant balances that you find with this you know retirement phase of dealing with that income capital preservation and the time factor required as you said to basically start drawing down on, on the capital that you have for retirement as a pension phase yeah i think it's almost capital preservation versus capital growth like you if you're I, we had a question there i think there was about uh what are the biggest mistakes people make and that's focusing mm -hmm. only on income generation um, and this is where, you know, if you're only focusing on income and the highest headline dividends, there's a big chance that, you know, that companies aren't reinvesting in themselves and they're actually depreciating in value. So to us, capital preservation is is as much important about growth. So we have the boring thing, which is I plus G equals TR or income plus growth equals total return and kind of reiterating that, that you need a balance of dividend paying or income paying and, and growth assets at the same time. Uh, and how do you balance it? You have to, in our view, you have to take a higher level. So we love spending time on stocks and going deep on investments and ETFs, but to balance those and to make sure you're not exposed to say, too much too exposed to growth stocks or technology or credit or whatever asset classes were, were underperformed last year, you need to look at a higher level. So your asset allocation level, uh, am I take, how much risk do I need to take to generate the income that I need? 
if I only need fifty thousand dollars and I've got three million dollars in super, well, why take more risk than you need to? You might have a growth objective as well, and then that that uh, suggests you need to take incrementally more risk. But start at the high level, defensive versus growth, and then break down into each asset class. And this is where, if you're really concerned about capital preservation, that's where alternative assets, non-correlated assets, uh, and and the investment selection within each of your buckets or asset class becomes even more important. So uh, that's a good uh, question there too, just talking about some of the more underappreciated sources of retirement income. Does that play into this as well? Franken credits are always good, but not just <laughs> Franken credits. Uh, but it, yeah, it's how do you, if you set up per portfolio perfectly for 2020, uh, and then the beginning of 2021, I think the, that portfolio would have performed poorly. If you set up for 2021 and 2022, it would have performed poorly. So how do you how do you stop that? How do you stop you know, the flows that go into the top performing fund or the top performing strategy of the year before? And we've seen that again this year. I think we we're talking about it before we went on air. That uh, all the asset classes that uh, probably should you should have been in 18 months ago are the ones that everyone's going into uh, yep. at the moment. Yeah, I agree. So the other thing that I would just sort of pick up there is that you spoke about one of the mistakes being, you know, not being diversified correctly. What's what's the other big mistake that you see in retirement phase? Is that is that also that, you know, the inability to to sort of draw down on your funds? Is it, you know, trying to basically live just off the income generated rather than using the, the capital you've got there? Is that the other big mistake you see the most or is there something above and beyond that? Yeah, there's an anchor. I think it's anchoring bias is what they call it. Yes, um, it we've, I've got clients I've met every year for the last 15 years and they want their balance to be the same level every year. And the entire superannuation system is set up for you to take more money out and for you to go down to zero. And I think it was part of their productivity commission report that said, you know, people need to be drawing down on their super. And that's why your minimum pensions go from 4% to 14% as you, as you get um, over 90. So it's, it's and not also not viewing the other parts, their other assets as part of their asset base. So you, your home, you're not going to hold your home forever. At some point, you might downsize, and that might turn into investable assets. So making decisions solely based on the small portion of your of your asset pool, um, but definitely. And then we've said it a few times: ignoring boring asset classes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the boring, bonds aren't boring anymore. Uh, I'd argue that they are, but like I, I, that's because obviously for me, it's it's just it's what I love doing, which is you know, bonds tell me so much what's going on in an economy, what tells me what's going on with a with a government and how that's going up. But I agree with you. And the other thing I remember, I mean, the last three years with bonds that I know you would have been saying to your clients and we say to ours is what's been going on, particularly leading into the to the pandemic and then what's been happening post. The movements in bonds has been abnormal. Like I, I remember sitting here just going. Do not expect an eight percent movement in bonds every year because at one point there they were doing that. People were just piling into them because it was really the only way to go. It gave you a security. And in 2019, I remember sitting there writing, going, "This is abnormal. You should not expect equity-sized returns in a market that normally should only be giving you about probably two, maybe three percent capital return per annum, and total returns about five. So. I agree with you. I think that they are more sexy. My, my other thing to sort of come to here is is you've spoken about it and we've sort of skirted around the issue about being welded to your investments and about, you know, obviously retirement phase forces you to start bringing your balance down. I know one of the key things that someone like Effie Zohos talks about is the old saying of don't die the, the richest person in the cemetery. Yeah. And, and, and that kind of space. <clears throat> Is there other ways that you can deal with that issue of having to start hitting your capital? Because I know it is a psychological thing. Is there other strategies or you know ways of balancing that that scenario of getting over capital preservation and understanding that your capital preservation is a term for making sure that you don't lose value, but capital needs to be used? Is there anything else that you guys talk about with, with clients to get away from that that really strong, not just anchoring bias, but also that sort of, it's actually loss aversion as well. Loss aversion is, is the other part of this change. It feels like you're losing money despite the fact that actually you're being paid by the capital you have. I think it's the, exactly what the role of a lot of advisors is, which is dealing with the emotional part, not necessarily the invest, like the investments become the easy part of being an advisor. Like you, you've got a framework, you make investment decisions, but the dealing with the emotional part is incredibly challenging. 
and I think it's just providing information. So I'm talking to a client at the moment that is changing their house, so they're upsizing rather than downsizing. And what impact will that have on my retirement income? And what we're doing there is just providing them with modeling. Obviously modeling depends on the assumptions that you make, but you can have some variability in there. Uh, showing them that on the new balance that they will have enough to generate the same amount of income they've talked about and for an extended period of time. So knowing that and even showing the charts that show their balance going down, but their income remaining the same throughout that period is incredibly valuable. Um, and I was, I've was i been talking about uh, a similar case for someone else that started with a higher balance, but spent a lot more in their first five or 10 years. Uh, and they've been able to sustain the same, a much a lower balance, uh, despite spending more than expected in the first few years. And giving them confidence that that will continue. So it's providing modeling uh, constantly in a, in a digestible format is probably key. And understanding there's lots of calculators around that can show you different asset values. You still have enough when you when you pass, essentially. We talk about death a lot, unfortunately, as well. Yes. There's a question I was gonna to ask too. It's almost like the reverse of what we was talking about then. And we get some clients that will come to us and because of a life event, whether it's divorce late on in their life, they've been left with a very small amount of superannuation or particularly women in finance. Um, they obviously, there's an issue, a bigger issue there that has to be dealt with. But is that again, setting real realistic, I guess, expectations if you do have a very small super balance and you're about to retire, it is going to be more difficult or is there still ways that you can generate some income without having too much much risk at the same time? Yeah, it's, you know, looking at other old sources of income as well. So age pension, we work with a lot of either widowers or uh, divorcees at, uh, in our business at various points. Uh, and it's just yeah, being open at the beginning and even with uh, people that are about to retire, people come to us, there's, I think there's a cartoon that talks about, you know, here's my finances, make it, I think it was something about being a magician, but here's my finances the day I retire. Now give me all the income I need or something like that. Uh, and it does feel like that a lot of the time, but it's being honest, a good advisor. Uh, there's a, we're a risk, or a lot of us just want to make everyone happy. So you know, not always saying yes to all sorts of spending, uh, but being open and honest saying, if you work an extra five years, even part-time, that'll increase your balance by this amount and potentially increase the amount of years that, you, that your asset base lasts. So it's being willing in the advice we provide to tell people what they don't want to hear sometimes, I think is the only way you deal with those. Um, those points, yes, yeah. agree. What we'll do, we'll keep moving. So again, we've we sort of, this is the final part of what we've talked about before we move on to the, the final part of this discussion, which is tax. And that's managing market volatility and protecting your portfolio, which is, we've talked about a lot about, you know, capital preservation and the retirement space. Right now is a great example. So the last, you know, year, Drew, having seen what's gone on, particularly overseas, as you already mentioned, you know, NASDAQ fell 30%. S&P at one point was down over 26%, finished down 20%. ASX managed to sort of somewhat buck that down 6.5% last year. What again is the best retirement phase scenarios that you've found to dealing with market volatility? Because you know, you look back at the GFC, and I remember sitting in my role then of dealing with clients that were basically just going, I can't do this, I need to get out. You know, I'm in retirement phase, I've just seen 40% of my portfolio chewed up, or at one point, 55% from the top to the bottom of, of the GFC decline. What's, what's the you know, we've talked about diversification, I know that, but. How do you deal with volatility? How do you look at volatility as a retiree when you know you do see that that overall capital position change on you on a regular basis? You've read Morgan Housel's book as well, I assume, the psychology of money. Uh, there's the one have. quote in there. Yeah, I've, I'm already using those lessons in the meetings I do. So there's one quote in there that talks about it. The the decisions, the day day to day decisions don't matter. It's the decisions on the worst days that matter most in terms of your portfolio. So you know, selling at the bottom or buying at the top or when, you know, if you sold in March, 2020, well, you missed out significantly and you, you know, you impacted your portfolio for an extended period of time. So apart from, we've talked about strategic asset allocation, that's kind of the boring part about managing volatility. And it's really understanding the drivers of every asset that you own. So 
it could be with with the amount of people that come in and see us that have multiple ETFs that actually do the same thing as each other and they don't actually know the exposures. So when the volatility hits, they don't actually know why it's there. So their portfolio wasn't really constructed to deal with more volatile environments. And then it comes down, I think we we're talking about it before, to companies. If you're holding a portfolio of direct direct stocks and you've got four banks and two resource companies, you know they're going to be cyclical and they'll basically trade the same way. So how do you find companies themselves that are resilient? And that's where we've looked uh, things like West Farmers, that's a conglomerate, things like Macquarie, where they have multiple sources of income rather than you know, loans and banking, like the banking sector. So mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you truly know what you're exposed to? And that was evident in the last, uh, in 2022 particularly, where I think a lot of people didn't realise that their, the growth stocks or the tech stocks, even the Aussie techs and small caps that they're in, exposed to, that they're invested into, they'd done incredibly well-driven returns for 10 years but they were sensitive to interest rate movements. And so were a lot of the fixed income investments that they were holding. So how do you do and how do you manage market volatility? You have a portfolio of assets that don't all act the same way or, or be aware of your exposures. So you know what, what decisions to make when, when. Yes, I think we've done that to death. So we'll move on for that, Drew, because I do want to come to, to this because this is, exactly also why we've got you here we get this question over and over and over again is tax efficient investment techniques um it is something that you guys i know do quite a lot and spend a lot of time with um first and foremost how do you understand like you know deal with the tax implications going into retirement and then post retirement you know what are some of the best strategies that you guys do to deal with the tax implications that come with investing and the retirement phase I mean, super is just by far, it's like the biggest free kick and the best structure, entity structure that you can have, whether that's an industry fund or an SMSF or a retail, whatever it happens to be. Superannuation, if once you retire, once you're over 60, it's essentially 100% tax free. So the more you can get, a lot of our advice is why we say we do transition and then into retirement, because in five years, you can make a significant difference to your, to your tax position. Uh, with a lot of clients that aren't retired yet, it's about managing the tax, the inherent tax. Anyone's invested for the last 15 years has capital gains in their portfolio. So how do you manage that over a period of time, whether it's put into superannuation or you know, fix your portfolio without paying a huge amount of capital gains? And then we tend to look at an asset base across multiple entity structures. So if you've got one partner's working, the other partner's not working, you've got superannuation or you've got a family trust, are there certain assets you can hold in each of those entities that are more tax effective? So higher growth assets that are more likely to have capital gains that are uncontrollable, like a managed fund invested in growth stocks, you prefer to hold that in a lower tax environment like super. Lower risk investments like bonds or less lower returning as they should be, um, you try and hold in a in a entity or a structure where you're exposed to marginal tax rates. So on that, that's the, the sort of the, the next part of this is how you start positioning with that tax structure idea. Um, yep. You spoke about, you know, if you have held, I'd even argue over the last seven years on a personal position, you're going to have you know, income tax to, to, to pay. How, yep. are you, how do you roll that through? How do you end up moving it to super? What, what sort of, you know, current scenarios allow you to do that? I know obviously your personal contribution is 27,500 now. Um, yep. But is there ways and methods to transfer assets into super that, that can be done? Yeah, so most, depending on your superannuation fund, you can contribute, make an, they call it in-specie contribution of shares into superannuation. It's usually much easier with a retail or a SMSF. Uh, I would say control it over multiple years. So if you've got a plan of when you're going to retire, wait till, you, wait till your taxable income reduces before you start realising capital gains on those because all those changes are CGT events. So they will trigger capital gains. There are options where you can purchase a listed stock from yourself, from your SMSF, as long as it's it's broadly listed. Uh, you can't do it with other with things like residential property, but you can um, with direct shares. So it's and then using the contribution cap. So your concessional contribution, as of a few years ago, you can actually claim a dollar for dollar tax deduction that goes against your taxable income. 
uh, in every year in your tax return. So if you're not working, or if you're only if you're only getting super guarantee of say ten thousand dollars, there's an extra seventeen thousand five hundred in tax deductions you could get by making that contribution into superannuation, as well as the, make, the, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to make you put you on your um your sort of forecasting hat because obviously super is something that politicians like getting involved with as well and and and, and moving around retirement age and, and what have you what do you see as the biggest policy headwinds that could come over the next 10 to 15 years is it the raising of the, of the retirement age is it like we have seen the caps you know going from 1.9 down to 1.6 million dollars and then raising you know the, the the tax on side of it what what is your view about where the future of those tax policies are going over the next 10 to 15 years? I think it's more likely to be caps and it will impact a small portion, not a large portion of people. It seems the way the governments are doing it. It super will be tinkered with every year or at least every couple of years. We've seen it for the last 10, but it's barely changed. They can't help how... themselves, can they? Exactly. Can't help <laughs> <themselves>. <laughs> it's, but it's... Uh, and as soon as it's reported as, you know, the government losing $55 billion because of frank credit refunds, uh, it becomes a political issue, I think, in the media. So uh, forecasting, I'd suggest there'll be a hard cap on superannuation balances, which you essentially have already. Um, you know, you've got 1.7, as you said, which is actually increased to 1.9, because another good reason, a good thing about inflation for retirees is that the, you know, the super balance cap actually goes up. So that's $1.9 million each from uh, 1 July, 2023. And then, I, I hate to say frank credits, but if anything, you'd probably see a cap on the refund, like a flat cap is what I'd expect at some point. Not saying it's going to happen any time in the next five or 10 years, and I'm sure you know, there'll be a lot of lobbying that will go against it, but that'd be the risk I see, just because of the, the generational inequity that people talk about with that. That's the final next question for me as well, is that you talk about the generational inequity. Over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, the transfer of you know, a huge amount of wealth is gonna come from the current baby boomer generation down. Are you starting to talk to clients about how to deal with that, that transfer of wealth, that, that trickling down that's in super, that's outside of super? How are you looking at the tax implications of that transfer of wealth that is gonna happen as that generation starts to move on? Yes, yeah, so there's a few, it's a massive part. We end up, a lot of our client meetings, we have children involved or we're helping, helping their, their children, if our client's 70, their children in their 30s and 40s and uh, helping them with certain parts of their situation um, as well. But there's, I mean, there's some small strategies you can use. It used to be called a recontribution strategy where you uh, essentially, the taxable component, so there's two components of superannuation, the taxable component of your superannuation balance is actually taxed when it's paid to non-dependent children. So an adult child will pay 15% tax on the taxable component of your super balance. So there's strategies where you can reduce that and hence reduce the uh, tax impact uh, when that's passed on. Um, but essentially it's, I think a lot of a lot of clients we speak to are trying to invest for their children as well. So continuing to grow that pool or getting their children involved in their superannuation at the same time. I think we're going to say we could get to the end of uh, the slides there. Maybe we might get to the question and answer time. So, uh, you know, if you definitely have a question, it's the best time right now to pop it through on the right hand side. You can actually type in uh, a question and we'll be able to answer it. Um, a lot of what we've spoken about so far has um, uh, we've covered so many different areas, I guess, haven't we? About passive income, yeah, yeah, yeah. diversification. That's exactly um, what I wanted to get Drew on because I know that he can cover this stuff like no tomorrow, and you can see that he is an absolute, you know, best in business stuff about looking at this space. And we know you've got lots of questions about super. You've been asking us for for a long, long time to do stuff like this. So, no, please don't get up there. There's a few other things that I think we haven't actually covered. Um, yeah, which, um, the, one there that I guess we get asked this quite a lot, particularly with our account type of setups. And a lot of people ask us, what's the best type of entity uh, to invest in order for income? I know you touched on it and you were talking about uh, super. Um, obviously, that's the best, but is there any others that you recommend usually or? Uh, it will depend on each, each person, but um, if you're nearing retirement or close to retirement, definitely super. As you step back from there, if you're 
professionals, if you run your own business, and naturally things like family trust or discretionary family trust become an option where you can stream passive income between different family members. Um, obviously, children would be taxed at adult tax rates for a normal family trust. Uh, and then it's holding uh, assets. If if one of the if a spouse, one of the partners uh, is earning less than the other, how do you how do you uh, you probably invest in the person with the lower taxable income to make sure they're not you know being taxed at the top margin or, or whichever marginal rate the other person is. So how do you balance taxable income depending on their age and situation? And that it probably falls into um, this I guess next question from Anne. Thanks Anne for the question. Um, are there any strategies for handling lumpy uh, capital gains tax, CGT? And concessional contributions is the essentially, unless you can delay that over a couple of financial years. So try to do one on, sell some on 30 June and some on 1 July, always helps with managing CGT. But otherwise it's that make a concessional contribution, which essentially reduces your taxable income uh, and allows you to claim a tax deduction on it. So you could reduce your capital gain by as, as much as about 27,500 would be one of the key ones. There's a follow-up question also by Anne. Um, is there any issues re manage funds and how you deal with them? I think I talked about this. We were doing one for having a chat with Owen earlier this week, which is the CGT implications of funds that you get a significant distribution in 30 June. So what we try and do is hold that in a less lower tax entity, or alternatively, if you're looking to invest, sometimes just wait. Um, so don't just do it in don't do it in June if you think if you know there's going to be a spend a great year and you're going to get convert your asset or in your investment straight into a taxable capital gain. So some of it is about delaying that timing. Again, we're not saying here timing the market, but we're using this for a timing yeah. of tax. <laughs> timing the so, tax. <laughs> <laughs> timing the tax, not timing the market. Yes, before I go on to the last slide, is there any more questions? Because we've had a great session um, and I am aware that if you do have a question, we want to give you every opportunity to do that. So if you please got them, please put them in now. Um, otherwise, we'll move on to the, the final slide and, and, and go from there. So Tom, I'll let you go on. While we, if we are, as I said, get on those questions now. But Tom, as always, I'll let you wrap up. Yeah, thanks so much uh, to Drew from uh, Bottle Partners as well for coming in and providing uh, the insight information that's uh, really well appreciated. Um, Evan as well. Um, if you've got any questions for us at InvestSmart, you can email invest at investsmart.com.au. Uh, there's also our online help centre and there's a chat as well. Um, but we're always there to answer any questions. Please let us know if we can give uh, different types of webinars and uh, I'm sure Drew's happy to, to come on again um, so even other areas that you might uh, have um, a bit more uh, insight into, we'd love to have you back for that as well. Yeah, appreciate it. Always enjoyable talking about retirement. <laughs> love talking stocks too, so happy, yeah, to, yeah. happy to go deep on that as well. So yeah, my thing as well, Drew, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to get someone like you onto here, getting to talk to something that we know everybody wants to talk about because it is something that we all will have to deal with at whatever point in our life. And um, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next month.